So thank you. I'm Linda Mahan and a member of the League of Larimer County in Colorado and also of the League of Colorado's Healthcare Committee. And on their behalf, I want to welcome you to our uh, discussion today about a very important concurrence that's being proposed. First, a little bit about the Healthcare Committee. Our League Healthcare Committee in Colorado was uh, begun actually last month to engage members across the state to take action to improve healthcare laws, policies, and systems in alignment with our league positions. And it will coordinate education and advocacy with local leagues and other organizations. And for those of you from Colorado, if you'd like to join that committee, we will be meeting this coming Tuesday at two o'clock, February 8th. And you can sign up for that on our league uh, web calendar. And our focus today then for our education will revolve around our national position and proposed addition to that. And we're very pleased to have over 68 people who had registered for this and um, hope that you will all enjoy the discussion. And to keep the background noise down, we do ask that you mute yourself. And for ease of viewing of the speakers, if you go up to the upper right hand corner in the view, and select speaker view, then you'll always have your screen showing the speaker today. And they'll be screen sharing some of their materials and that will pop into your screen also. We're gonna begin with a presentation by the two leaguers. And then that will be followed by a question and answer period. And during their presentation, if you want to put questions in the chat, uh, my colleague Barb Dungey will be monitoring that and we will ask those questions then after they finish. And also you'll have a time that you can, if you want to unmute and raise your hand, uh, we will call on you and you can ask your question in person. We are recording this today and this is going to be published on our YouTube channel for the League of Colorado. I think now I'll go ahead and introduce our two speakers joining us from New York. Barb Thomas first joined the league in Billings, Montana, and has been active since the late 1980s in her local league now of Saratoga County, New York, where she has been president for over 20 years at some point in that period. She's also been a member of the board of the New York State League and serves as the issue specialist for both equality of opportunity and for medical aid in dying. She has a master's degree in elementary education and social studies and was the executive director of a four county Planned Parenthood affiliate. She co-chaired the health care update committee that developed the new New York state health care positions. And the second uh, speaker, her partner is Dr. Judith Esterquist, a member of the Long Island New York League for five years where she has served as the health care chair and supported voter services forums and DEI initiatives. Uh, Judith has recently been appointed to the New York State Issue Specialist position for healthcare. And she holds a PhD in English from Harvard where she taught for a decade before spending the rest of her career decades in management consultant with global responsibilities. She was an active member of the New York State Healthcare Update Committee. So thank you and welcome to you all. And I'm gonna turn it over to you now, uh, Judy and Barb. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to see so many people participating today. And I certainly want to officially thank the League of Colorado and especially Linda Mahan for hosting this event. Um, as um, Linda said, I'm Barb Thomas from Saratoga County, and my co-presenter is Judy Estequist from Port Washington, Manhasset, which is on Long Island. And we were both members of the Healthcare Update Committee that developed the New York State League's new healthcare positions. Um, we'd like you to list your local league in the chat right now so that we'll know where you're from. And to save time, we are going to ask you to um, hold your questions till the end, as Linda said. So um, 
We'd love it. Thanks. What exactly are we asking you to do? Mainly, we're asking you to recommend this concurrence for consideration at the convention by putting it on your league's program planning survey response. Doing that does not commit you or your delegates to voting for the concurrence at convention. But naturally, we hope that your delegates have some sense of the way your members feel about the issue and do vote for the concurrence. All our concurrence materials are now online and will be there for the next five months. The URL to access them is now in the chat and we will circle back to any specific questions you have at the end of the presentation. And that's a part of what you would see. Concurrence is a very specific league process. It depends on some league entity doing a study and reaching a position. Other leagues can then agree or concur with that position. That is why the wording can't be changed. Concurring with another league's position allows you to have a position without spending the time and resources to conduct a study. A lot has changed since the main part of the national healthcare position was adopted in 1993 and the New York League positions. There were two, one on healthcare in general and one on the financing of healthcare, were based on studies and updates that dated from 1985 and were last revised in 1991, except for a section on advanced directives that was added in 1999. The easy way to update the national position is to concur at convention with a position, in this case, excerpts from the 2021 New York State positions. We can't change the language of the existing national position without a study, but through concurrence, we can add to it. So how has healthcare and its delivery system changed since 1993? There have been great advances in medical care. Pharmacological treatments have become more effective in curing, treating, or delaying the onset of many serious conditions, even making previously lethal chronic diseases manageable. Complicated surgeries have become more successful. Think heart transplants and now routine joint replacements. But costs have exploded, creating inequities in access. Families spend way more on health care than they did in the 90s. And many employers no longer offer health insurance for their employees. Others require increased employee contributions and offer plans with lower premiums, narrower networks, and increased cost sharing, reducing access for even middle-class Americans. And taxpayers are paying more for health care, too. Providing health care for government employees, the indigent, the incarcerated, and with pricier privatized care for seniors, long term dialysis patients, veterans, and others. Americans are now paying twice as much for health care per capita as Europeans. We're paying more in taxes for health care than they pay for all their health care, and they cover everyone. In 1990, healthcare expenditures were 12% of our county's G country's GDP, and now they're 20%. But on important measures, we are not getting healthier. And access now depends much more on where you live, how much you make, and what kind of work you day, do. Today, fewer Americans can afford access to healthcare. Thank you, Barb. The cost of health insurance premiums has tripled over the past 20 years. 
from an average cost of just under 6,000 to over 19,000 per year with bigger shares paid, paid by workers. Employees, employers are also choosing plans with greater cost sharing. Healthcare has become prohibitively expensive. The bottom blue and black lines, inflation and wages, have gone up 26%. The green line is premiums, up twice that. And the orange line is cost sharing, which has increased 162%, eight times faster than wages. This orange line, deductibles and co-pays and everything we pay after you've paid premiums, plays a huge role in reducing American access to healthcare. It's a cost control method lauded in the 1980s and 90s, which raises total healthcare costs and reduces public health. It's why the concurrence seeks to add, quote unquote, evidence-based cost controls to the National League position. But doesn't job-based insurance offer equitable access? Well, more high wage, workers, high wage workers get health benefits than lower wage workers. Let me use some New York State examples to illustrate what federal poverty level means on this chart. In New York State, 90% of families making under 50,000 a year get no health benefits, but 85% of families earning more than 200,000 do get benefits. Is this equitable access? So why do we believe Americans depend on worker health benefits? Well, in 1991, when the National League was studying healthcare, more than 77% of private sector jobs had it. Now, only 40% do, about half. And it's dropping every year. Newly hired workers don't get health benefits, nor do gig workers. Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, Instacart, are all speeding this trend. Healthcare access today is far less equitable than 30 years ago. What's happened in public health? Now this slide is complicated. So just note that the red line is lower and flatter than the other lines. The red line shows the US as an outlier. It's flatter because American life expectancy lengthened three years over the past quarter century, while peers with universal healthcare all the black, all the other colors, live four and a half to six years longer, with healthcare costing half as much. Treating healthcare like a market harms public health. Across the country, 166 rural hospitals have closed over the past 15 years. 47 filed for bankruptcy just in 2020. 40% of the rest are in dire straits. And the map at the bottom Purple means that more than half that state's rural hospitals could close soon. Fuchsia means 20 to 50% are at risk. But here's worse news. Hospitals that stay open are cutting services like behavioral health, like substance abuse, like maternity wards. And when maternity wards close, obstetricians and midwives relocate. On this map, the 90 counties in black show where hospitals have closed. The blue counties are where hospitals shut down obstetric services. No, they still open, but no maternity wards, no obstetricians, no midwives. What happens when Americans live 40 to 200 miles from the nearest OBGYN facility? The red line shows the US trend. The black lines show a dozen peers, but According to the WHO, out of 183 countries, 157 decreased their maternal mortality between 2000 and 2013, when the US rate rose sharply. 157 black lines went the other direction. Of the 31 OECD countries, only Mexico has worse maternal mortality. Black mothers, our black mothers, die at three or more times the rate of white mothers. Our rural areas are two to three times worse than urban areas. Our urban areas are two to three times worse than Europe's. 30 years ago, too many American mothers died of pregnancy-related reasons. Since then, many countries have halved their death rates. Ours have almost doubled. 
Now, primary care isn't profitable. It's reimbursed at lower rates. Medical schools discourage students from entering primary care. Yet the family doctor who knows you and your medical history is the backbone of good care, or was 30 years ago. Across the 3,000 US counties, only the pale blue counties have enough family doctors. Look for the pale blue counties. And note, much of rural America lacks broadband, so telemedicine isn't an option. This is why we're asking supporters of our healthcare concurrence to also support the digital equity concurrence. Now that we've set the stage for why a healthcare position adopted 30 years ago might need updating, let's discuss the New York State study and the proposed concurrence. In 2019, there was much public discussion about adopting a New York State single payer system. So the New York State Board recommended that the 2019 convention update our position on financing of health care. The board wanted to ensure member support and understanding of the existing position and its consequences. By the fall of 2019, a committee was formed consisting of seven members from various regions of New York State, including three PhDs and four with experience in the delivery of healthcare. We compiled and summarized health policy sources and then culled them down to 50 footnoted pages of study materials, which included the two rewritten positions. In late fall of 2020, we sent the positions and study materials to local leagues for concurrence by March of 2021. Of the 31 leagues who reported their discussions, all concurred with the healthcare position and all but one concurred with the financing position. In deciding which language from the New York State positions to include in the concurrence statement, our healthcare update committee, which is the group bringing this concurrence forward, looked at what was important to add to the US position, removing redundant and state specific language from what is being offered. When we look at the goals in the national position, they call for every resident of the US to have access to a basic level of quality care, distributed equitably at reasonable cost to patients, individuals, and taxpayers. As we go through these points, we have put National League's wording in green and New York's in purple, so you can see clearly what we propose to add. Here's what we want to add, protecting the vulnerable, and by doing that, protecting public health. The pandemic has certainly shown us that we need to add telemedicine and other innovative delivery settings to our repertoire, and that we need to separate healthcare access from employment status. We'd add safe staffing, which is defined as a minimum number of staff with specified training required to care for a specific number of patients at specified risk and needing particular kinds of care to keep patients safe and to keep staff safe. We spell out the right of patients to make their own healthcare decisions in consultation with whomever they choose. We call for cost controls to be evidence-based to show that they actually reduce costs for the whole system and that they don't increase disparities of outcome. We specifically add that the single payer concept is viable and desirable for achieving the league's national goals of affordable, equitable, universal health care. And that states can act as laboratories of democracy by piloting state-based programs of universal health care until such time that a federal program is enacted. Additionally, we also call for regular assessment and transparent administration of the healthcare system. This slide shows you the actual wording of the goals in the existing national healthcare position, which will not change. 
This slide shows you the actual wording of the language from the New York League's positions that will be added to the existing national position. It will be up to the national board to decide where to add this language. I'm going to read it to you. In goals, the league supports regulatory incentives to encourage the development of cost-effective alternative ways of delivering and paying for health care. Delivery programs may take place in a variety of settings, including the home and online, and must provide quality care, meaning consistent with standard of care guidelines by trained and licensed personnel staffed adequately to ensure their own and patient safety. As public health crises increasingly reveal, a health program should protect the health of its most vulnerable populations, urban and rural, in order to protect the health of everyone. In addition, all programs should be evaluated regularly. Decisions on medical procedures that would prolong life should be made jointly by patient, family, and physician. Patient decisions, including those made prior to need, should be respected. This slide shows the current wording of the national position as it relates to the financing of healthcare. You will note that the current wording doesn't actually use the term single payer, although by calling for a national health insurance system financed through general taxes that provide universal access, it implicitly supports single payer. And the call for a transition from employment-based insurance to universal access is a call for the unemployed, the disabled, the young, and those whose employers don't provide health insurance to all of them have access to health care. This shows financing er excerpts from the New York positions that would be added to the national one. The new position would make support for a single payer system more explicit and provide the rationale. It would strengthen the concept of separating health coverage from employment. We all recognize that Americans enjoy their mobility and optimally, you'd have the same universal health care access regardless of the state you live in with no gaps or waiting periods after you move. But this section recognizes the role individual states have traditionally played in piloting critical legislation, from seat belts to gay marriage, from drug laws to environmental protections. It also recognizes the role of, that the Canadian province of Saskatchewan played in 1962 demonstrating the feasibility of its single payer health care and prompting all of Canada to follow within a decade. It also calls for continued federal funding as a necessary part of the funding mix before the league will support any state bill. Some of the cost control methods listed in the national position like mandatory second opinions and cost sharing have raised total system costs. Remember, a concurrence cannot revise the wording of an existing position. It can add new wording that is not in opposition. Everything in the New York State position was reviewed with this in mind. This slide and the next one would add to the national position on cost control. Given the much faster than inflation increase in healthcare costs since 1993, when the national healthcare position was adopted, we in New York State require that specific cost control methods should reflect the most credible evidence-based research available on, health, on how healthcare financing policy affects equitable access to healthcare, 
the overall quality of care for individuals and populations, and the total system costs of healthcare and its administration. And that methods used should not exacerbate disparities in health outcomes among marginalized residents. The League has always called for universal access to health care, but our recent emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion requires us to pay more attention to the way that certain cost control measures unfairly impact marginalized communities. And by that, we mean rural residents, people living in urban healthcare deserts, people who identify as non-binary or LGBTQ, non-English speakers, the incarcerated, the undocumented, as well as people of color and specific ethnicities. Reduction of administrative costs is a key benefit in a single payer system since it eliminates the need for providers to employ a brigade of billers and coders to keep up with the requirements of multiple insurance, just as it eliminates the brigade of insurance administrators whose jobs depend on denying and de or delaying care. And we have the experience of single payer systems like the Veterans Administration and Medicare where administrative costs are less than 3% of total costs, not the 15 to 20% or even 30% for some private profit insurance. Negotiating volume discounts with pharmaceutical companies would likely achieve the 50% savings achieved by the Veterans Administration for its 6 million patients. These cost control methods reduce the overall costs of healthcare by reducing harm, such as reducing malpractice errors by systemic quality improvements, or preventing serious disease with early intervention and rather regu yeah, regular health education. Today, preventive care isn't profitable for private insurance. Paying for preventive care for patients who change insurers represents costs, but no savings. When everyone in the state is in the same insurance pool, preventive care reduces the total cost for that person and reduces the overall system cost. Similarly, most people who need assistance with daily tasks prefer to remain in their own home if possible. And paying for short and long-term health care is usually less expensive than institutionalization because the patient continues to pay for their own housing and food. This requirement for public participation in health care policy just makes explicit the League's long-standing support for public input into all government decisions. This is the same page you saw before. Legislation that encompasses these additions, just one of them in a bill or many of them in a bill, will allow the League to advocate for reduced cost, improved public health, and making both access and outcomes more equitable. What has the pandemic taught us about our public health? That white dotted line shows the G7 average life expectancy before the pandemic. Our six peers outlived even white Americans by three and a half years. And whites outlived blacks by more than three and a half years, who outlived Native Americans by yet another three years. The pandemic has worsened our health disparities. These columns show the worsening gap in American longevity. We died two years younger than peers in 2010, and three years younger in 2018. And in 2020, the gap rose 50% to over four and a half years. On average, this is bad. For the marginalized among us, it's been catastrophic. Life expectancy in France fell seven months. In Germany, three months. 
American whites lost 14 months, but Latinx lost three years. So do blacks. American blacks now die almost 10 years younger than G6 residents. Harlem, the South Bronx, the East Bronx lost one half percent to 1% of their residents. It's like having 3.3 million Americans die. COVID has killed black and indigenous people at three to five times the rates of whites and at much earlier ages. So what caused most, most deaths before COVID? Well, the five leading causes of death are the same for all Americans, urban and rural, black and white, but more black Americans die and die faster at the rate at triple the rate of whites for respiratory diseases and 70% higher for cancer and strokes. And more rural Americans die and die faster. For cancer, it's four times the rate. Yet 86% of these deaths are preventable. 86%, these are people's lives, Americans. Americans aren't getting what people in peer countries get routinely, prevention, treatment, affordable care. Americans don't have family doctors. They live too far and they fear getting sick. It costs too much. Two thirds of bankruptcies are caused by medical debt. I find these differences astonishing and tragic. For Americans, your zip code predicts how long you live. As we've seen, rural Americans have less access to healthcare, fewer hospitals, fewer primary care doctors, less insurance, and are more likely to die preventable deaths. Lack of access to healthcare kills. Ditto for black and indigenous Americans and ditto to no access, even with telemedicine. And add in people doing essential jobs who must interact daily with the public. Essential workers with no sick leave and no healthcare and no choices. This is why the American College of Physicians recommended rolling out COVID vaccinations by zip code, not age. Before we end, I'd like to add that COVID taught us about viruses riding subways, trucks, and planes, and inevitably reaching even remote Alaskan villages. Notice how much of Alaska has among the worst death rates. Ease of travel is one obvious reason why the US has experienced more epidemics over the past decade than anywhere else globally. But the WHO, which has documented about 200 epidemics per year recently, notes another reason. The US, despite its wealth, is seeing such devastation. The most, difficult, the most difficult to control epidemics occur in countries with poor public health, among populations without equitable access to primary care. The League of Women Voters and the WHO have similar goals, but our league needs to become more explicit in our advocacy, hence the need for this concurrence. I'd like to end with a quote from the 2018 WHO Handbook on Epidemics. Universal health and health security are two sides of the same coin. Ultimately, the absence of universal health coverage for our most vulnerable people, is the greatest threat to health security for everyone. The League's advocacy for equitable access to healthcare will certainly benefit, benefit marginalized Americans, but it will equally benefit vulnerable Americans, which means every one of us. This PowerPoint will be made available on request but all of our concurrence material will be online for the next five months being updated as we go. You'll find directions for filling out the National Program Planning Committee's online survey with links to the survey so your league can support getting the, this concurrence and others discussed at convention. And while of course, we hope your delegates vote to support adopting our, concur our concurrence, your support on the survey does not commit them either way. You can also find a link to the digital equity, equity concurrence materials and the most up-to-date list of leagues who've already signed on. Right now, it's 39 leagues from 13 states, about 5% of the leagues in the United States, but we'd really like to get it to 10%.
before I say thank you, I'd like to just add, when you go to the online concurrence page, you will see it's, it's long, but part of what you will see are the specific requests we are asking leagues to make. Get on your league's agenda and ask for their support. If your league decides to support this, please complete the US program planning report. There is a, there is a link to it just below this. It tells you exactly how to fill it out. And we're asking you to put the exact language in the box into the, this, this box, into the question box, so that there is no confusion about, uh, about what we're doing. So thank you, and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Barb and Judy. This was very, very informative. And as you can see in the chat, many people would like to have your slide deck. So if it's all right with you, I think in a follow-up email, we can send that out. Okay, thank you. Good, well, we've got some very good questions here that I'd like to um, put out to you. One of the first ones had to do with the big difference in maternal um, death rate. And that they're wondering is what, what do other countries do that we don't do that makes ours twice as high? Um, they, first of all, have most of the European countries have a long um, period of postpartum care. Um, mothers generally have six months to a year of paid family leave when they um, ha have a birth. So they have, besides having the health care, they have um, sometimes um, visits from some, from like a public health nurse um, to actually um, see what's happening and to reassure or to tell people that really, yeah, what their experience is a problem and they need to go and be treated for something. Okay, thank you. Following along in that um, same vein of public health, a question came in when you referenced the regular assessment of public health metrics and coverage and funding. You know, around the country, we have seen a lot of public health departments coming under fire during the pandemic and public health directors uh, resigning. Um, do you think that the position uh, should be strengthened more with regard to public health, or do you think some of the elements that you included really start to give us more legs to stand on in our advocacy for public health? Both. I, 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 it is my belief, and I, I don't have a degree in public health, and I've not spent a lot of time you know, studying public health other than comparatively, but but our public health suffers both because the public does not have access to doctors and it suffers because it doesn't have funding. And when you don't have a population that understands what public health departments do or why they exist, it is very hard for them to, 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 to survive something like the pandemic. And it's my personal belief, and I have I saw one article that mentioned this, and I've been chasing the reporter and haven't been able to reach the reporter. It is my belief that when people do not have family doctors that they trust, and they go to clinics, and it's a different doctor all the time, or they're they have employee-based insurance, and the network keeps shifting, so you keep shifting your policy and your doctor. If you don't have a doctor you trust, why should you trust doctors? Mm -hmm. That relationship of people with their primary care. Yes. And I think as Barb pointed out in other countries, that's the real emphasis of their public health of their system, rather than on specialists, which you yes. see once or twice. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I would just to affirm what Barb said, one of the biggest way our, in, our infant mortality is also astonishing and awful. Yes. And, and infant mortality is most affected by regular skilled prenatal care, regular skilled postnatal care, because when you take care of the mother and the mother is monitored and taken care of, it takes care of babies. 
And it probably helps that there is essentially subsidized or free daycare in most of these countries. So that if I have a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old, I can focus on my infant and not have multiple children all demanding my time. Yeah, yeah. All right, and uh, from Carolyn up in Alaska, she asks how to deal with the battle of the ideology of socialized medicine in America. This is something all of the single payer people have worked for years around the messaging. And the messaging is difficult um, because people with a real stake in the profit system that our insurers have um, like to sling that word of, of socialized and and I but I think what we have to say is it's universal care and it's supported by everybody all taxpayers pay in um and that it really is to the advantage of everybody. I mean, we've seen that in the pandemic that, um, you know, if you are in contact with other people, you need them to be healthy too. <laughs> I also pick up that New York Health, um, two of the legislators in our assembly did a short video, which I should, which we should send to Linda to send out. Now this is about New York Health Act, not about anything else, but it's two firefighters, two, two assembly people who are dressed up like firefighters, talking about what privatized capitalistic, good kind of market economy firefighting would be like, rather than terrible socialized firefighting and not their building, if you don't have insurance, we're not going to fight your fire. And the way I often pick up the socialized medicine is, well, you know, we have socialized police and socialized schools and socialized firefighters. We have a socialized military and we have socialized medicine effectively for all of these groups. So what you're saying is the only people who shouldn't get socialized good like this are people who actually work for a living in the private sector. Because in fact, Medicare is socialized, the VA is socialized. And, and we have, when it is around the public good and it is cheaper and more efficient to, because it's not a market, healthcare isn't a market. When I get sick, I go to a doctor and I trust the doctor to tell me what's wrong with me. That is not how I buy a car. I do not go to the dealership and say, hey, I think I might need a car. What do you think? What kind of car do you think I need? An expensive one or a cheap one? Oh, the most expensive one with all the highest stuff? Oh, okay, I trust you because you're the expert. That isn't how car dealerships work. Thanks, um, Judy. And um, there's also um, just a question repeating. How does the league support putting two con with two concurrence ideas into the form? Would you review that again? So it is our understanding. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Judy, go ahead. It's our understanding that there are two boxes that can take suggestions from a local or state league as to what else they would like to see on the proposed pro on the recommended program for the convention. So what we're talking about when we say recommended program is essentially the agenda to be discussed and voted on. Each of those boxes will hold 300 words. And each of the concurrences for healthcare and for digital equity is under 120 words. So you could drop in two of them and have room for another few sentences in one box. And then you have room for as much as you can fit in in the second box. My league will also be probably doing three, con uh, supporting three concurrences. We will put two in one box and one in the other. Here's a big And question. that's essentially what we've been working on. Yeah. Are there any people um, who would like to unmute and ask a question directly? 
I've been pulling questions from the chat, but it occurs to me that maybe some of you would like to actually speak. Anybody? And uh, Barbara, can you help me look if there's hands raised? Yes, I will. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for you to think of your question, one other question came in. It has to do really with the tremendous amount of money that's already flowing around in our healthcare system. Do you have any ideas about how the league and other activists can combat this large amount of money in the vested interests? Well, what I would say, and I've spent this morning on email with a couple of friends in New York who are disappointed because we don't have, we, we have a majority of sponsors in each chamber and it's not clear that we have a majority of votes. What I, what I try to say is as of now, corporations don't vote. They can give campaign note donations and PACs can give campaign donations, but they can't vote. Healthcare is part of the conversation because of the pandemic. Most people realize how, how disastrous our response has been. They don't realize that the United States has lost more people per 100,000 than any country other than Russia. I mean, there are countries in Europe where their population grew during the pandemic. We lost people. And the reason for that is that the pandemic is around us and people care about talking about healthcare. So if you can get voters to realize what, what they could do about it, I think you can get voters elected representatives to vote properly, but only if there is mobilized groundswell. Carol Mattoon, you have your hand up? You're um, mute. Someone wrote in there that they would like the script as well as the slides. Will that be available? Probably. <laughs> we, 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 right now it's in, we, we, we might need to clean it up so that it's in standard English. We'll give you time. But actually, I think that um, if you have the slide deck, there are notes that yes. are at the bottom that are most of the script. That's true. Good save, Barb. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Barb, have you, are you seen any other questions uh, coming through that I have missed? Yeah, I'll send them to you. Okay. So I see one that says, how do we respond to people who say we've got to be loyal to the ACA, to, the, uh, to Obamacare? And my reaction to that is, Legislation isn't loyalty to one bill over loyalty to another bill. For the league, what we look for are advocating for legislation that will serve the public good. And I don't know how much activity will we should spend on healthcare at the congressional level right now. I would think it is very important to spend our activity at the state and local level um, so that local local communities and states think about how they can save costs and improve health care across their populations. Because I think there are very few states who aren't at least a little worried about it, regardless of what their governors say. Okay. Uh, there's one more question I uh, saw here asking about ways that single payer would be paid for. We don't usually go into that in our positions other than our original position says, but to pay before by taxes. Did you look at that any further in your study, Judy and uh, Barb? Um, so the answer is, so let me start by saying, I, we didn't show a slide that shows that the United States current, although Barbara said this, currently pays more in taxes for our health care than most of the developed, than all of the developed world other than Switzerland pays in taxes per capita. 
Oh, I've got that back. The, the rest of the world has a certain amount they pay in health care total per capita. You take the total expenditure for the country, you divide it by the population, that's how much they spend for health care, either in taxes or out of pocket. In the United States, if you take the amount that we spend on taxes right now, it is more than what those countries are spending for all of their health care. Plus, we spend another $5,000 out of our own pockets individually. support the who would like to support the New York position that they wait to do that until they see the outcome of our position so that they can include both um, when they fill out the documents. I, I, I would second <laughs> that. It is not clear to me, and I know that this may not be politically correct, but it seems to me if there are two or three or four uh, activities that are happening stemming up from the grassroots that we should be able to support more of them rather than fewer of them. Yes, I agree. And we have essentially 600 words of space to put um, suggestions in. So it's not um, impossible to do that. I think you, you just have to be not... Um, aware of that, but and also I would like to point out that the form isn't really due until March first. Now I don't wait. Think advise you to wait till the last day because you might encounter some problems with the online form. But if you you know you don't you don't have to do it tomorrow. All right, um, Beth De Haven, do you still have? Yes, you do have your hand up. Go ahead, Beth. Yes, I just had a general question about concurrence. Um, I understand now the difference that with concurrence, you don't, you add to a position, you're not changing it. If you had to change the US position, you'd have to go to a study. But looking at what you're wanting to add, it seems like quite a bit. And so I'm just thinking, what is the decision factor when it comes to whether you're going to try to change it? Because I feel like adding on, and I, I I guess I'd have to see the whole position then, but it seems like you're going to have a huge document after a while if you keep adding on. So just some commentary on that would be helpful to me. It's five hundred. I think you're right um, in terms of the fact that it it does make it a lengthier position, but it is a position where, like when you look at, say, the part on safe staffing, that allows you um, and any league throughout the country to then support that kind of a law. It's not, um, you know, a whole package that everybody has to use all in one. Um, it has those components, and that's what makes it um, helpful to a lot of leagues. I think a lot of leagues don't have their own healthcare position. And I think also um, that we, when we look at this, we know that the National League, because it's something that we all agree on, is that voting rights and access to the polls are absolutely core issues. And it's we don't want to necessarily take resources from that to conduct a study. And don't forget, um, for those of you who maybe are just recent members of the league, it often takes two years and a, quite a lot of resources and staff, you know, national staff time in order to conduct a study. I, I would say that our entire edition is 500 words, so it fits on one page. And you can look, you can find it on our website. And, you know, some positions run, you know, three sentences and some positions run three pages. And it kind of depends on how, how much you split up the issue into separate positions and how much you treat healthcare like one thing. Uh, Barbara Pearson, would you like to add your comments now? I would, except I'm writing somebody else's 
chat. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing that people don't talk about, and I think it was so clear in the slides that Judy and Barb showed us, is that we don't have services where we need services. And one of the, one of the fallouts of having a profit-based system is that there are no services where you can't make a profit. So if we had democratic governance, governance on our um, on our healthcare, they would be able to make system-wide decisions and not ones that require them to give more resources where there already are resources. And that's that's a huge piece of what could happen. The fact of having democratic governance of our healthcare instead of arbitrary decisions made by corporate executives whose job is to make as much money as they can. And they're making it where the money is. But then look at those maps. Look at all the places where you don't have maternity. Yeah, one of the, one of the really dense places for doctors and hospitals is New York's Upper East Side. Now, I don't know if the rest of you know what New York Upper East Side is like, but it's got it's got uh, 10 years. It, it, it has a life expectancy that is higher than Japan's and a, you know, wealth per block, which would, you know, scandalize anybody. And 10 blocks north. Life expectancy drops 10, 10 years because it was redlined. It's part of Harlem. And the per capita income is probably what five percent. Yes, thank you, Barbara. Healthcare you. follows money. Yeah. Well, and then the other point that is somebody said about not having this, not having to do a study, but the study's been done, right? They're just leveraging the study that they already did, so it's not. And it is going to make it a, a, a more useful position so that it, it's longer, right? Uh, Carol Matoon, do you still have a question or a new question, or has your hand just been up all day? No, I have a new question. A new question. All right, go ahead. And you might be the one to answer that. On the top of the survey, <clears throat> it says only complete surveys will be used to summarize the program planning survey results. So does that mean if you leave one of the questions empty? that they won't use your survey? I noticed that Betsy Lawson has joined this group. Can we yeah, direct I don't know. to is, you? Is Betsy, Betsy was a long time yeah. league staff person now consulting with the National League. Betsy, would you like to answer that? You're still muted. Let's see. Can I unmute you? You can ask her to unmute. I don't know. I've can asked you hear her. Me now? Yes, we can. That's good. Okay. Uh, no, the answer is no. A completed survey. Uh, there, there are some. I mean, we prefer that you answer all questions, but uh, no, everything that's that's submitted is counted. Thank you. That Not feels reasonable and fair. So what, what does that mean by a completed survey then? It means if you don't hit submit, which is a problem we have had in the past. Oh, okay, thank you. That makes sense. All right, we, we're about at an hour now since we began. So if there are people who would like to leave, uh, we appreciate you coming today. And we do plan to send out a follow-up email and it will include the link of this recording on the YouTube channel. And um, Beth has put that link in, in the chat. We'll also include the slide deck with the, the little bit of a script that we have. It will include perhaps the link to the page where all the concurrence materials are available on the New York site. And it will include an invitation if you'd like to join the national Google group and conference calls, we'll give you some information about that, that connects you between now and convention with what's going on. And then I'll just say all of us in Colorado are looking forward to seeing you in Denver in June. Hopefully things will come together that we all can 
uh, meet. And meanwhile, I hope that there will be a lot of virtual opportunities also for caucuses and other conversations around the convention. So stay tuned to that. Um, there is a link for a convention concurrence discussion group also that I would I like to include. I here in 1993 for 20 oh. Uh, I would like to include that link too, so that if you have not seen that yet with the different concurrences that are being proposed uh, from around the country, that will help prepare you and your local leagues to go and be informed ahead of the time. And also perhaps you'd like to include some of them on your response, your program response. So Judy and um, Barb have agreed to stay on for another 20 or 30 minutes if you need to leave. Have a good day, and uh, if you'd like to stay, please do. All right, are there other questions here? Barb Dungy, have we seen any others in the chat that maybe we could bring up now? I, 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 got, one, I got a direct message where someone said, so how different, how different is this from the US position? And what I would say it is additive the, it is it is built on the U.S. position, which in principle is really good, but it's 30 years later, so we are adding things that no one would have expected in 1990 when they started their study. So Mary has her hand up. Yes, um, I have a question. Um, would would the league support expanding access to health care in other ways before um, we can politically get to single payer? For instance, I'm a retired nurse, by the way. It it seems to me like expanding Medicaid, we call it Medi-Cal here in California, and um, lowering the age for Medicare would help, would be a faster way to get more people covered. So which level league are you talking about? Uh, any league. I mean, with that, I'm not sure. I guess I'm not so, sure so, how so, it all so, works. So, so what I would say is that, you no, know, Barbara is a probably, Barb's probably going to correct me because what I know about the league has, is because the last three years of her, of her mentoring. But my first reaction is Medicare is, is controlled by the federal government. If we want that to be extended, it is something that Congress and the, the Congress has to do. Medicaid expansion to a large extent is in the states. That is where you advocate for it at the states. And then there are local things that you can advocate for. So yes, of course we want to expand healthcare, you know, geographically by income, by marginalized sta status, by zip code. And part of what this concurrence does is give more ways to try to expand it in, 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 in step back from the ledge. So, so positions allow you to have principles that allow you to score legislation. You don't write positions so that you can advocate for things. You write positions because they make sense. And then you look at the legislation and see if this legislation makes sense, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. So what you want is as robust a position as possible for the kinds of issues that leagues and legislators will be wrestling with. And I think you're one of the things this does is give you more ways to expand healthcare including telemedicine and clinics and schools and home care. I mean, Jan, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, Jan, do you have a question? Jan Phillips. Yes, um, I was just wondering if we're able to use any of the graphs you had in your presentation for letters to the editor or a brochure or anything we wanna come up with for our league. So some of those graphs are ours. Some of those graphs are from an organization known as PNHP, Physicians for a National Health Plan. 
And both league, and it is my understanding that league, if one league does it, other leagues can use it. And I know from PNHP that if you're using it for good, have at it. Okay. So yes, the answer to your question is use away. All right, and Carol Mattoon? Um, back to the question that was asked before that, um, as far as uh, doing more piecemeal, uh, not trying to get everything at once. Um, when Medicare was passed originally under Johnson, I believe it was under Johnson, uh, at that point, it was supposed to be everyone would be covered. And because they were having trouble getting it through Congress, well, they did it just for people 65 and over. And after that piecemeal parts of that to make it better, they didn't think it was going to take over 50 years to actually get everybody covered, which we still haven't achieved that goal yet. So the league has piecemeal pieces in, the government has piecemeal parts in. However, you know, isn't it time for us to go for the gold? Um, Olympians don't try to get the bronze medal, we try to get the gold medal. And so as much as we can get in and having New York do this study a two-year study is a super big deal. And to have think that we're going to have another league do this or national do this, um, it's going to be another 10 years or so. So I, I really admire what New York has done. And I think we should try to go for the gold. And I'd like to have even more in than, than we did. But I think this is really an excellent addition. And we're, someone had mentioned, well, you know, it's 500 words too much. Um, there's no limit on how many words has to be in there. The best position that we can have so that all leagues can use it, I think is really ad advantageous. Thank you, Carol. Are there other um, I want to say something about that. Although I obviously um, think it would be fantastic to actually have a good single payer system. I think that some of the other parts that we're adding through this and um, like the telemedicine, like paying attention to um, disadvantaged populations are things that that we can use um, in terms of specific legislation, I would say pretty much at the state and the national level, I don't think we actually, maybe I'm just thinking from the New York point of view, but at the local level, we don't con have any control over um, legis, you know, the rules for healthcare providers. However, local control does have, have influence over public health. And some of our issues around uh, dis disparate outcomes, disparate treatment, disparate access, disparate quality, those can be, those can allow bolstering of a local public health. So what I would say to people is the US League has its hands full right now. It has in fact advocated for single payer. It has, it has supported uh, uh, some of the bills in the past, but right now voting rights, I'm think this is a dumpster fire um, and it's all hands on deck, but at the state and local level, we've got a lot more room. And I agree, we can expand, Medi New York has, I think expanded Medicaid more than any other state, very expensive. But you know what? It means that the delta between New York going for single payer, which is what the New York Health Act does, and without all those taxes, it's a smaller delta to get there. And it means that our healthcare costs are high enough that when you look at it, you can see a real difference. So whether your state has expanded or not expanded healthcare and is closer or farther away from universal. Think about what you can achieve. Look for legislators who will propose bills and, and get the right bills up. I also was corresponding with uh, Linda Hawkins in Louisiana this week. And they had expanded Medicaid in that state, 
but she's concerned now with their election of a new governor coming up in the fall that that may go by the boards. So I think that those of us that are in states where we are changing elected officials also can keep this in mind going forward and use our position to continue to strengthen if it's Medicaid where you are. Yes, Medicaid is a good program. Karen has her hand up. I was just gonna say, I think one of the things that, that we can do at the, at the local state level is begin a massive campaign of helping to educate our legislators you know, I think they bought the Kool-Aid too, that, you know, somehow, you know, Medicare for all is socialized medicine and nothing good can come from that. And I think there is adequate research that can be shared. Uh, Colorado and Linda Mahan, you, you have much more information on this, but uh, a document has been developed in Colorado that refutes a lot of that. And if we could just get that information to our legislators and figure out some way to make sure that they actually read it and then have a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, the more people that you have that really understand what's happening now and how switching over can change um, the cost and, and, and the benefits to everybody, that might be another way of approaching this as well. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I just I like to that. add that. Yeah. Speaking with your own local legislators and letting them know what you think and what is important to you is a really important thing um, to, you know, even if you suspect that your legislator agrees with you, they like to know that they that you think the same way or that you support something. So I would encourage, and if we have this position, you know, the part there are parts that you probably can use at um, a fairly local level. Mm -hmm. I and certainly like letters agree. to the editor. What, 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 our, what our legislators hear, they hear from a couple of very large, supposedly nonprofit health hospital corporations. Um, which my daughter has now said she's never going to use again because she went in for a for a um, uh, a, a, a test of her throat, not COVID, um, and cost her one hundred and eighty dollars a week ago. And she said, "How can a throat culture, a strep culture, how can a strep culture cost one hundred and eighty dollars?" Well, and then she saw some reviews that said this particular nonprofit hospital which owns many of the hospitals and many of the urgent care clinics and many of the, you know, on the street doctor's clinics has enormous revenues, which they use for things other than shareholder value, but they don't use them as a nonprofit would. So I agree with Barb. Those are the ones who are talking to our legislators. They need to hear from voters and the league about what we care about and why they are buying myths and drinking Kool-Aid that, that, that are not actually, do not have a basis in reality or facts. Are and I say questions? that knowing that, you know, that, that, that there are groups in New York that will happily tell you that all the Canadians are coming to the US for healthcare and that Canadian doctors are coming to the US when in fact the exodus of doctors from the US to Canada is far, far higher. Example. Uh, yeah. This Do you have a Betsy. question, Bet uh, Betsy? Is it Betsy? Uh, not a question, just a comment. I mean, um, the number of organizations that lobby on healthcare in Washington, DC is phenomenal. And there are so many vested interests, whether you're talking about the hospitals or the doctors and, and the subsets of all the doctors groups. Uh, I remember attending a, a meeting um, on Capitol Hill back in the days of the Clinton healthcare plan, and there were 300 people in the room. So I, I, you cannot underestimate that. It's- Don't forget the insurance companies. 
Yeah, so I've heard Don't forget that the pharmaceuticals. That pharmaceuticals have hired five lobbyists for every member of Congress every year. And the health insurers, it's two or three lobbyists for every member of Congress. Think how big the league's lobbying force would have to be just for healthcare to counter that. Well, maybe then this is something that we need to do a better job of getting out to the American public. How much money is being spent to maintain a system that is broken and is costing us way more than what we are getting in return for our investment that has nothing to do with health care? You know, television advertising for pharmaceuticals, massive marketing, uh, large um, dividends for health care for people who invest in health care. None of that money goes into actual health care provisions, making making the American people um, healthier. I don't think probably many most Americans realize how much money is spent on those things in order to mm -hmm. maintain the status quo so that those who are making excessively large amounts of money, uh, including CEOs of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and others, um, you know, I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy um, burden to 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 take on. But I think that's part of it too. Is is education? Yes, thank you. So I want I want to thank Betsy for all her work when she is surrounded by hordes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting off those hundreds of other lobbyists on healthcare. Uh, I hope that you did see in the chat she had put up earlier that um, the league has, in the past, lobbied for some healthcare for all legislation. Too. And the National League has been very strong on supporting the ACA and. It and expansions, defending, defending it, um, which is, you know, not the whole ball of wax, but it's um, very important for everybody, really, because it improves our health. Uh, Carol Mattoon, do you want to add another comment? Carol, I think her hand may be up by. My um, when we talk about education, it's really hard to get our message out there when you're fighting all the big money that's out there. The real answer here is campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. That's that's the underlying problem there. And one of the, you know, everybody knows Christian cinema right now. Um, she has received, last I heard, and that was about a month ago, $750,000 from health care. So she's, uh, that's influencing her decision right now on the whole filibuster and uh, build back better and all that. Is both Democrats and Republicans, including Nancy Pelosi, all of them are receiving such huge amount of money from the pharmaceutical, medical supply, whatever you wanna call it, healthcare, that it's very difficult for us to get our message out. Well, I think Carol to um, applaud you is is uh, also important because you and some of your colleagues down there in Arizona have been doing a good job of opinion pieces in the papers and just letting the public know what kind of funding is going into their elected officials. Thank you. All right. I don't see any more hands. I'm sure those of us who care deeply about this could continue to chat away our Saturday on this, but maybe there's some other things you need to do, like get out and take a walk. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, and close this up for today and hope that in the next week, we can get out to you this powerful follow-up email with all kinds of links and ways that you can keep working on this. And then, as I said before, uh, please do come to Denver in June, join the convention and meet us all in person. I think Barb and uh, Judy have pretty much prepared their caucus material right here. 
that we could see um, in June, and maybe it'll be virtual, virtual as well as in person. So I don't know, Beth, do you have any other closing remarks here before we close down? Um, I think that um, the recording may have been off for a little while, Beth. I tried to record it again to the cloud. I'm not Great. sure where to find that, but maybe you can help me. You bet, no problem. Right. Sorry about that. I lost internet for a minute. Uh-huh. All right. Well, then, thanks to you all for joining us today, and have a good weekend. And thanks to Colorado for being Thank a Thank you. Real yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks to Bye. everybody who was here. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye, Judy, and we can chat about this after if we need to. Absolutely. Thank you. Excellent job, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you.